Welcome to the Our Dad Stamps YouTube channel. My name's Pete West, and like a lot of people my age, I started collecting stamps as a child, encouraged by my father who was an avid collector. 20 years ago I inherited his collection, and at the same time I also inherited my wife's dad's collection. Since then I've been buying and selling stamps through my online stores at Del Camp and eBay under the name Our Dad Stamps and this has allowed me to grow the collection into what you see behind me. With these videos, I want to share some stories and information that I've learned about stamps and stamp collecting. I hope you enjoy them, and if you do, don't forget to click on the like button and subscribe to get regular updates on new content. Hello again from Our Dad Stamps podcast. This week I'm pleased to say that we've surpassed 20,000 views on my YouTube channel and I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's contributed to that. I'd also like to say a big thank you to people that have left comments as well. It's always useful to know what people are thinking and it's nice to hear positive comments. And one of the comments that keeps coming up is how good Sheila was at questioning and how pertinent her questions were during the podcasts. So I'm pleased to say that today Sheila is back to uh, join in our podcast. So welcome Sheila. Hi Pete and thank you very much for inviting me back and congratulations on reaching such a huge milestone on our dad stamps. Yes thank you. Two weeks ago I did a video regarding Queen Victoria Great Britain stamps and how I displayed them in value order and by plate number. So today I thought I'd continue with that theme and actually look up where you find the plate numbers on Victorian stamps. Now, for the purpose of this podcast, I'm only going to look at the ones where the plate number is actually inscribed on the stamp. Earlier, the penny blacks and earlier penny reds and tuppenny blues you were able to work out the plate number with a lot of experience and a lot of detective work. But on all of these stamps that we're going to talk about today, the plate number is actually written there. You just need to know where to look and how to find it. So can I just say, Pete, if we have any new listeners, what exactly is a plate number? A plate number, when a stamp is printed, how it worked in Victorian times, somebody would engrave a stamp on a, on a metal block that would then be reproduced 240 times onto a metal plate and then that plate was hardened and then that's how they printed off the stamps and because those plates were used so frequently they wore out sometimes they broke sometimes so they had to be replaced and the plate number is just which one of those plates was used okay. the number of the times the plate used varied a lot um, the hardening process is especially in Victorian times, is not an exact science. So, so sometimes they wore out very quickly and only a few were used. Hence, they're worth more money for that plate. Sometimes they lasted a long time and there's loads of them, so those tend to be worth less. So each plate would print 240 stamps? So just to recap, each plate has 240 stamps engraved on the block. So when a sheet of paper goes through, it prints off 240 stamps. That process is then repeated for as many stamps as they need or until that plate wears out and cannot be used again. Now, in the mid-1850s, 1860s, the post office decided that they would actually write the plate number on each stamp because it aided the accountancy process. They could work out how many were used. But it also meant if the plate got damaged and didn't get noticed at the printer's, Hopefully it would be noticed when somebody looked at the stamp and they could say, hang on, this plate has broken this bit off, we need to repair it or destroy it and, and make a new plate. For that reason, they decided to put the plate numbers actually on the stamp. And it started with Penny Reds and the Tuppany Blues, which were the only two stamps in existence when this first started. And the Penny Reds started with plate number 69 because they'd got up to that number on the pre-existing before they decided to, to add the numbers and 
it goes all the way up to plate 225. So you can see just how many penny reds were printed. There were millions of penny reds printed. Uh, as I said, they intended it to be from plate 69 to 225, but in actual fact, plate 69 and plate 70 were defective and they destroyed them, so they were never used. Also, plate 75, 77, 126, 128 were also destroyed. However, there is a, an anomaly with plate 77, because theoretically that was never used, but some of, of plate 77 stamps have turned up and they are worth a fortune. But nobody really knows where they came from. So where have you found out this information about these plate numbers that were defective? There's a fair few books written about plates and about the history of, of stamp collecting, so it's, it's not too difficult to come across. And the, the Stanley Gibbons Specialist Catalogue, which is where I've got most of this information from, details it in quite a lot, so it's, it's out there. So yes, so back to the, the Penny Red. As I said, there are 200 plates to look for, and one of the popular things to do is to collect all the different plate numbers. And you can find specialist albums with a, a separate place for each different plate number. So it's something you can collect with the Penny Reds. And the plate number is actually written in the latticework on the side of the stamp. The way to find it is if you turn the stamp on its side, the edge at the top has got the plate number in the right way up. And if you look closely, you can find the plate number written in the latticework. Now, sometimes it's really difficult to see. Sometimes it's covered with a postmark even. But it is on both sides of the stamp. So when you look really closely, you can see the numbers. And bearing in mind, it starts at 71. So sometimes there'll only be two numbers. Sometimes there'll be three numbers. You have to look carefully to make sure you've got the right one. And don't be confusing plate 177 with plate 77, because there's about £100,000 worth of difference in value. As I said, sometimes it's difficult to see. And in fact, there are some that I've looked at that I have no idea what the plate number is. And, and it's just, it's been covered up with postmarks. It's been worn out and it's just not possible. But generally, it's there to see. And if you look on the, the YouTube video, I've highlighted exactly where it is. So hopefully people will be able to see it. On the Tuppany Blue, it's in exactly the same place and in exactly the same method. So again, once you know where to look and where they are, you can find them on the Tuppany Blues as well. On the Tuppany Blues, there's a lot less. There's only plate 7, 8, 9, 12, 13, 14 and 15, because the Tuppany Blue was used a lot less than the, the Penny Reds. OK, so the next one to look at is the Hapney stamp. The Hapney stamp is an unusual stamp. It's half the size of a Penny Black, and it's the smallest stamp that's ever been produced in Britain. It's often known as a bantam, and I have no idea where the word bantam comes from. But the plate number is in a very similar position. So on the bantam, as I said, it's just beside the half of the half P. And once again, if you turn the stamp on its side, the number at the top is the correct way up. I think it's even harder to see on the halfpenny than it is on the, the penny. But if you look closely, it is there. And like all the other stamps, there's only a certain number of plates that were used. A few of them were destroyed because they weren't good enough. So you can find plates 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 19 and 20. Plate number 9 is worth considerably more than all the others because that's one of the one of the plates that wore out very, very quickly for some reason or another. So how are you doing with your own collection of these particular stamps and all these plate numbers? I'm pleased to say I've got most. I haven't talked about that. I haven't got plate nine, but I've got all the other plates of the penny, nearly all the plates of the penny. Again, there's one plate 225 is much more valuable than all the others, and I don't have that one. And was it quite easy to come across the ones you have got? Yes and no. The cheapest way is to buy a huge bag, plate it yourself, and then when you've got a few gaps left over, then you search specifically for that plate number. It's also more fun. But as I said, you will find some plate numbers are more expensive than others. That's because the plate wore out quicker or got used less. In the case of the penny, plate 225 was the very last plate and they only used it for a few weeks, I believe, before they, before they decided to change.
So we're talking here about two really old stamps. Do they still use the plate number system on current no, stamps? No, it faded out in the 1880s, 1890s. They decided they didn't need it anymore for whatever reason and, and it, it stopped being included in the stamp. And I don't know of any other country that have actually put the plate numbers on, on a stamp. I could be wrong on that, but... I don't think any other countries have done it. It was peculiar to the British stamps. So something for people to put a comment on as to whether they've got stamps from different countries with plate numbers Someone on. Someone with more knowledge of another It'd country, yeah. interesting if, to know. If, if they do have plate numbers, it would be interesting, yes. Uh, the last one that is a bit difficult to find is on the Penny Hapney stamp, or the Three Hapens, as it's actually written on the stamp as Three Hapens. The Three Hapney stamp... It only used two plates, plate one and plate three. Once again, plate two was destroyed because it didn't work. And just to confuse you, plate one hasn't got any numbers written on it at all anywhere. So the only number to be looking for is plate three. And the plate number is in the bottom left and bottom right corners, just above the check letters. Again, it's in the lattice work and you have to look quite closely to see it. Sometimes it's obliterated by a postmark, so it's almost impossible to see. But it is there. As I said, it's only the number three. If you find one without a number on it, then it's plate one. That's a relatively easy one, and, and you only have to collect two stamps, so that's not so bad. After that, we then get to the what they call the surface printed stamps, which were easier to print, and the plate numbers are much more visible on the Tutney Hapney stamp, which started off a, a pinky colour, then it changed to blue. It goes from plate one all the way up to plate 23. And the plate number is in a white circle at the top of the, the stamp, so it's very easy to see. All the plates were used. The only one that you can have slight variety is plate three. It's, they changed the watermark halfway through. So with plate three, you can have it with an anchor watermark or an orb. So why would they change the watermark on a particular stamp? Any ideas? It was just for security reasons as much as everything else. They, they kept changing the watermarks quite a lot in the early days. Later it stayed at, with a crown or crown CA, which would, stands for crown agencies. And there are lots of different watermarks to look out for on the Victorian stamps. So after the Tutney Hapney is the Thrutney stamp, and once again, it's got a big circle at the side with, with a number in it, so it's quite easy to see. Plate one was not used. Plate two and three don't have a number in them, but their design is different because it hasn't got the round circle where the plate number fits, so you can see which is plate two and which is plate three. And I've put on the images, there's dots on plate three to distinguish it from plate two. However, plate three is worth about £30,000, so it's unlikely you're going to come across many of it. These go all the way up to plate 21, and once again, all the plates are used. It's easy enough to find the plate numbers. The Faulkney stamp, once again, plates one and two are in a different colour, so they're fairly easy to distinguish. Plate three and four, which happened on a few stamps in, in Britain, there isn't a number drawn on there anywhere, but in the check letters of the corners, plate three is just a normal check letter. Plate four has a thin line known as hairlines diagonally across the corner. And you can easily see it even with the naked eye. So if you see what's called hairlines, that makes it plate four, that's all. And then from then on upwards, um, they didn't use plate five and six but it went from plate 7 to plate 15 in vermilion, as it's called, orange. Then they changed the colour to green for plate 15 and 16. Then they changed the colour again to brown for plate 17 and 18. But the plate numbers are still in the same place for all of them. The 6 mini stamp, like the 4 mini stamp, early ones didn't have a plate number written on. But plate 1 design is totally different from all the other designs. Plate 2 wasn't used. Plate 3 and Plate 4 as hairlines and no hairlines, the same as the Faulkney one. Then we get Plate 5 and Plate 6 have a number in the bottom left and right hand corners, which is quite easy to see. Then Plate 7 one wasn't used. Plate 8 and 9, the number's in the same place. But also, interestingly, the sixpence doesn't have a hyphen in it for Plate 8 and 9. It does have a hyphen in it for all the other plates. 
I don't know why they decided to change it, why they thought it was necessary, but on all the early plates, it's six hyphen pence. On plate eight and plate nine, it's just six pence. So presumably for these plates, they were each stamp was individually engraved? Yes. How it works is a master engraver transfers a picture onto a, a metal block. Then there's a process where that block is copied, as we said before, 240 times onto a, a large plate. I have to say, I need to watch how it's done. I'm not fully understanding how they go from one block to 240, but they are identical copies. And it, and it goes onto a, a softer metal and then it's hardened. They should all be identical. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? It's not as if you're actually constructing the stamp through individual blocks and it's a bit easy to leave off a number or a letter or yeah. something. Yeah, so that's right. in theory, you've got the master and then you're just duplicating that for the that's 240. It. Sometimes when the plates wore out or a bit broke on a plate, they would repair just that one. So you would get one stamp in a sheet of 240 where something gets broken off for a few sheets or even a few hundred sheets. Then they realised it had broken and that was repaired. So that's what produces some varieties and is, is uh, well sought after. The sixpence changed colour in 1870s to a, a chestnut colour and the design also changed. And we had the plate numbers move to the top corners of the, the stamp rather than the bottom corners. Then it changed colour again to grey. And also they moved the plate numbers to the middle in it finally as well, up to plate number 18. So with the six, but there's three different places you need to look, but they are, once you know where to look, they are quite obvious. With the eight pence, nine pence and ten pence, they're not, they weren't commonly used values and only one plate of the eight pence, one plate of the ten pence, and two plates of the nine pence were ever used. So there is no need to look for plate numbers. They're, they are clearly on there on both eight pence and the ten pence. And on the nine pence, they're not there on the first plate, which is plate two. And then there's a plate number on the second one, which is plate four, because the two others broke. But as I said, it wasn't a commonly used stamp, so they didn't need to produce that many plates for that one. So what year are we talking about with stamps being eight pence and nine pence? This would have been eighteen sixties, eighteen seventies, and it would have been. It was surprising actually. It was quite expensive to send uh, letters overseas. And the, the next one is a shilling one. The shilling stamp is an interesting stamp, and I'm not quite sure what was going on in the minds of the post office at the time. They started off with plate one. It's a different design from all the other stamps. Each one of these values has a slightly different design. There was no common theme amongst it at all. It was just, oh, we need a shilling stamp. The post office contacted the printers and said, can you design a shilling stamp for us? And it was either accepted or not. So there was no sort of long-term planning. But the shilling stamp, which is green, the first plate, plate number one, had no plate number on it. And then from then on in, there's a little square on the side that has the plate numbers in. But the second plate that they used, they decided to put a one in it, even knowing that that was plate two. So plate two has a one where the plate number should be, just to confuse everybody. So you've got plate one with nothing on it, then plate two has got one on it. Then they didn't use plate three, and then they caught up with themselves and realised what was going on, and plate four has actually got a four in the, in the square. Probably a bit of a bad day at the office. But, yes, as I that. said, I'm not quite sure what the thinking behind that was, but uh, the one shilling was used quite extensively, surprisingly enough, and that goes from plate one, apart from plate three, it goes from plate one all the way up to plate 13. And then they changed it to orange. And there were only two plate 13 and plate 14 in orange. But it was exactly the same design and the plate numbers in the same place. Above the shilling, again, as you can imagine, they weren't used an awful lot. There is a two shilling stamp, which only has one plate used, plate number one. Again, it's easy to find. The five shilling stamp, there were actually three plates used. Plate one, plate two, plate three broke, didn't they didn't use it, and plate four. Plate four is extremely valuable, four, five thousand pounds minimum. And have you got one of those? Which is why I haven't got which is why there's a blank <laughs> space in my album, unfortunately. And then I haven't got the tension in all the pound, but both of those is only one uh, one plate number as well. So what year are we talking about here? If we're talking about ten shilling stamps. That would have been still eighteen sixties. They would have been used for probably for parcels to send a package across to South America, say, or, or the West Indies. 
There are actually the five shilling, although it's quite valuable, to, a five shilling stamp not in great condition uh, is quite common, relatively. I mean, you, you're still looking at paying £25, £30 for one, but it's no more expensive than the penny black to buy, as long as you don't want one in, in perfect condition. Yeah, it's surprising which ones are valuable and which ones aren't valuable. Okay, so after that, as I said, in round about 1880, the post office decided that they didn't need to put plate numbers in anymore. And so the stamps after that didn't have any plate numbers. And as far as I know, unless you were a, a, a highly technical specialist, finding the differences between the different plate numbers is not something I know anybody has done but it, it it's probably possible with with a lot of study so there we go i hope that has helped people to um discover where the the plates are if you are listening to this on anchor i would thoroughly make, recommend having a look on youtube because with all of these i've got images of exactly where to find them and seeing it is much easier to understand than, than trying to listen to it but uh, i hope you found it useful and uh, thank you for coming back with us, Sheila. Well, and thank you for asking to... me, and congratulations again on your huge number of um, subscribers on YouTube. Yeah, and thank you to all my subscribers and listeners, and uh, we'll see you again in two weeks' time. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope you found it interesting and enjoyable. Don't forget you can visit my online stores at eBay and Dell Camp under the name of Our Dad Stamps where I have over 2,000 items for sale. Please join us again in two weeks' time for another edition of our Dad Stamps podcast.